Hi friends, so today we start question bank 2 and I'm going to discuss 10 questions in mathematics and then I'm going to give their solutions. So this set of questions is going to be useful for you if you are preparing for some interviews, for example in admissions to universities and also for job interviews where you may be asked math question. Also if you are somebody who is preparing for tests. So let's begin. First, I'm going to discuss the 10 questions and then the 10 solutions. So if you are somebody who wants to solve these questions, listen to the first part of the video, stop it, then try to solve it, and then listen to the 10 solutions out there. That's going to give you the maximum benefit out of this video. So question number one involves solving this equation. And as you can see, you have to solve for variable x here, which satisfies this particular equation. Question number two is an integration problem. So you can see here it's given to you that dy by dx plus this expression equals to zero. And you have to solve for y as a function of x, if you can do that. Question number three is one more equation and you have to find value or values of x which are going to solve this equation. Question number four asks you to simplify this determinant. And so you have this determinant here where A, B, C are constants and you have to reduce it to the simplest possible form. Question number five is a problem involving limits. So you have these two functions here which are divided x square minus four divided by x square minus five x plus six. And you have to find the limit of this particular function as x tends to 2. The next question says that you are given a particular function f of x and you have to find the critical points of this function. Now sometimes this is also known as stationary point. So you have to find these points for this function and you have to also determine the minimum and maximum point of this particular function. Question seven gives you a function y that's expressed in terms of the natural log sec x and tan x, which are trigonometric functions. And you have to find dy by dx. Question eight asks you to find the value of x where the matrix A given here becomes a singular matrix. Question nine asks you to find this integral which involves the functions sine of x and cos of x. And finally, question 10 asks you to calculate A, A, T and A, T, A, where A is a matrix. So A transpose is given as 1, 0, 2, a column vector. So now one of the things you can do is you can try to solve these questions and then you can look at the solutions which I'm going to give you in the second part of this video. So let's start with problem one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the questions in red, then I'm going to try to solve it in blue, and then I'm going to give you the solution or the final answer in green. So that's going to help you figure out what's going on. So we start with this question here, and you can see that there are three roots here these are all square roots and so one of the things which comes to your mind immediately is that you could square both sides of this equation so let's start this process we square it once so we get x root x root x equals 2 square we square it once more we get this equation here and we square it once more you get this equation here so at this point you can clearly see that you have x to the power 7 equals to 8 because 4 plus 2 plus 1 which are the powers of x here they total up to 7 here so we get this final equation here now you can of course move this 7 as 1 by 7 to the right hand side and so you get x equals to 8 by 7 which can be simplified to 2 to the power 1 into 2 to the power 1 by 7 or we can write x is 2 and 7th root of 2. So that's going to give you the solution here. So this is like a warm-up problem. Very often when you are going for a 
particular interview scenario, it's a good idea to ask a simple question before you move on to more complex question. That gives time for your brain to warm up. So now let's come to the problem number two, which I have given in red here. So here you have dy by dx plus this expression equal to zero. Now, this is of course a differential equation, but you can see that even if you do not know anything about differential equations, you can still solve this equation if you put it in a form which can be expressed as integrations, which is something you will know from calculus. So let's do that. We move this part to the right hand side. And so we get here. Then what we can do is on one side of this equation, we bring in all the values which are functions of y. And on the right hand side, we put all the values which are related to x. So that's what we get here. So we have essentially separated this equation into the x part here on the right hand side and y part here on the left hand side. And now I need to go back into the memory banks and check. And you will remember that root one minus y square, if you want to integrate it, it's going to be sine inverse y. So this is an inverse trigonometric function. And then the right hand side is going to be the inverse sine of x. And there is of course the negative sign here. And we add a constant because we are dealing with, a, with an indefinite integral. So immediately then I can write out the solution in this form by taking the sign of both sides. Now for most people, this is going to be a good point to end this problem. But if you are somebody who is particularly fond of formulas, you may actually remember that there is a formula which links sine inverse y plus sine inverse x. And if you remember that formula, you can write this step out here. I have given these steps in the yellow box and you can write it in this form. So I can just put a sine inverse of c here. This c is not the same c, but if it's a constant, I can write it something like this and then I can expand this out. So now this is the formula which combines sine inverse x plus sine inverse y as sine inverse of this expression. And if I were able to get that, I can write the final expression in this form, which is actually the solution of this differential equation. So you can see that in many cases, the formulas which are there for the trigonometric functions can become very handy if you are looking for nice solutions for differential equations. So let's now come to question number three, which involves solving this equation. Now, sometimes people make a mistake that they will simply cut off x, the four here, and they will say that x equals x minus one, and that's not going to lead them to a good place. So some people are better off and they put a plus minus here, and in that case, they will get one of the roots. But you know from these kind of equations that there are going to be more than one solution. Very often the solutions come out as complex numbers, so we can try to get them. So what we can do is rewrite this equation in this form. And whenever you are able to write an equation in a form which involves a square minus b square equal to zero, it's going to help you. Because do remember the formula that a square minus b square is a minus b into a plus b. So now we can use that formula here where we think of x as a and we think of x minus 1 as b. And so we write this out here. So once we do that, we can further simplify this equation by realizing that this part also is in the form a square minus b square and so we simplify it out further. So now what we can do is we can simplify each of these expressions in the bracket. So this becomes 2x minus 1. This becomes x minus x plus 1. That is simply 1. And this becomes x square plus x square minus 2x plus 1. So that gives me this expression here. Now this factorization which we have been able to do will help us locate some of the roots. So immediately one of the roots is going to come from 2x minus 1 equal to 0, which is going to give me x equals to half. Now the second root is the solution of this quadratic, 2x square minus 2x plus 1 equal to 0. 
So of course you can solve it by invoking the formula for a quadratic, which I have done here. Remember that quadratics can be written as ax square plus bx plus c equal to zero. And then we have a formula to solve it that x is minus b plus minus root b square minus 4ac by 2a. So using that formula, I get this simpler expression for x here. And of course, you see that you have a square root of a negative number here. This is going to be square root of minus 4. And then after I cut off some of the values here, I get x is 1 plus minus i by 2. So in this case, you see there are clearly three roots here. One of the roots is real, that is x equal to half. And the other two roots are complex conjugates, that is 1 plus i and 1 minus i, both divided by 2. Now let's come to question number four, which was how to simplify this determinant in red. Now you could take a long way about doing it by expanding this out in terms of minors and cofactors, but you can actually use some of the properties of determinants to do this much faster. If you see that there are some obvious symmetries out here in this particular determinant. So one of the rules of determinant is of course that I can add different columns of the determinant and that's not going to change the determinant. So let's do that. Let's invoke the rule that C1 is C1 plus C2. So I'm going to replace this column C1 by C1 plus C2. So that's what I've done here. And so what happens that column here, the first column becomes A plus B plus C, A plus B plus C, A plus B plus C. So this question has been formulated such that something nice like this happens. And then immediately I can take out this common term out of the determinant and this becomes one, one, one. Now there's one more property of the determinant is that if two of the columns are same, then the determinant is going to be zero. And so the solution of this problem is that this determinant is simply zero. So you can't get much simpler than that. Now let's come to question five, which is this limit here. Now, sometimes people immediately take the L'Hopital rule here. They know this or this limit is in the form zero by zero. So what they do is that they try to differentiate the top and bottom, and then they plug in the value x is two and try to solve it. But in many cases, especially if you are going for a interview setting, it's a good idea to try to solve it using first principles because if you try to use L'Hopital rule, the professor will probably tell you to solve it using factorization. So that's what we have done here. We have taken the numerator and denominator and we have factorized it. So remember that again, we can use the formula a square minus b square is a minus b into a plus b. So we factorize it here. We get x minus two into x plus two. On the denominator part, we can clearly see this could be represented as x square minus 3x minus 2x plus 6. So I can get here x minus 2 into x minus 3. And then I can cancel this x minus 2 out and I get this here. And I plug in x equal to 2 into this expression. And that gives me the limit as 4 by minus 1 or minus 4. So that's the limit for this particular problem. Now let's come to question number 6. Question number 6 was to find critical points of this function. Now the critical point of a function is the point at which the derivative of the function becomes 0. So I immediately take the derivative f dash x. That's going to be 8x cubed minus 8x and I can set it equal to zero. Now, these are also known as stationary points of the function. So once I get f dash equal to zero, this equation, I need to solve it. So immediately you see that eight can be removed here. It's common here to both sides. So I can just get rid of eight. So I get x cubed minus x equal to zero. Then I factorize it. I take an x out and I get x square minus one. And then I can write x square minus one as x minus one into x plus one equal to zero. So immediately I get three roots. I get x equal to zero, x equal to one, x equal to minus one. So these are the three critical points of this function. This is a very important concept in optimization.
and mathematics. So once I get this point, I can say these are critical points, these are stationary points, these are candidate minimum and maximum point, but I cannot say if they are maximum or minimum until I look at the second derivative. So that's what I do. I take f dash dash x, which is the second derivative. And I can immediately write this as 24x square minus 8. Now let's plug in these three values. So I plug in x equal to 0 here. So I get f double dash 0 is minus 8. I get f double dash 1 is 16. I get f double dash minus 1 is 16. Now remember that whenever this second derivative is less than 0, that's a maximum point. And whenever the second derivative is greater than 0, that's a minimum point. So that's a definition. And if you are more interested, I will put a link to my optimization videos at the end of this particular video. So from this, I can clearly see that there are two minimum points for this function, one maximum point. And remember, these are all local minimum and maximum point. Also, in case there is a function which has more than one minimum point, for example, that is known as a multimodal function. So now let's turn to question number seven, where we had this nice function involving the natural log sec x and tan x. Now I can differentiate it. I can differentiate it in a more clean manner if I define u as sec x plus tan x. So I can write y is log of u. Then I can write dy by dx is dy by du into du by dx using the chain rule. Now I can write dy by dx as dy by du, which would be 1 by u. Remember the derivative of natural log u is 1 by u. And then du by dx would be sec x tan x plus sec square x. So remember the derivative of sec x is sec x tan x and the derivative of tan x is sec square x. So I can then immediately write this out here. I can bring out the sec x here. So I get tan x plus sec x, which is here. And then once I realize that tan x plus sec x is nothing but u, I can write this here. And so the derivative becomes sec of x. Now, this is a nice problem where I had a more complex function as y. And actually, my dy by dx became a more simpler function sec of x. This doesn't happen in many cases, but in this case, it did happen, which is nice to see. Now let's look at question number eight, which was the matrix A given here. And we are asked to find the value of x at which this matrix A is singular. Now remember the matrix A becomes singular when the determinant of that matrix is zero. So that's the concept being tested here. And this is important because whenever you are solving systems of simultaneous equation, the matrix being singular or not plays a very important role in terms of whether the solution exists or not. So let's write out this determinant and then try to expand it. So to expand a three by three determinant, we can take here one and then we can take this smaller determinant two by two, three zero zero four. I have a minus one here, I get minus one and then two x zero four. I get a plus one and I get two three x zero this whole thing is going to be equal to zero. So we are using the theory of minors and cofactors of a determinant. Now let's simplify each of these determinants. So this is going to be three into four minus zero into zero. So that's 12. This is going to be two into four, eight minus X into zero. So that's eight. And this is going to be two into zero minus three into X. That is minus three X. I solve this equation, I get 3x equals 4, so I get x is 4 by 3. If you plug in x is 4 by 3 into the matrix and then calculate the determinant, you will see that the determinant is going to come out to 0. So that is the condition at which A becomes a singular matrix. Now, singularity often needs to be tested in various problems because if your matrix happens to be singular, very often bad things are going to happen to your numerical computation process. Now let's look at question number nine, which was finding out this integral sine 4x by cos 8x dx. Now, just looking at this integral, I can realize that this integral could be simpler if it was converted using tan and sec. 
So we immediately do that here. So we can get sine 4x by cos 4x, which becomes tan 4x. And I get 1 by cos to the power 4x, and that becomes sec to the power 4x. Now, this my trigonometric equation or function can be further simplified if I realize that sec square x can be written as 1 plus tan square x. So I get this equation here. Now, once I get this equation here, if I remember that the derivative of tan x is sec square x, then life is going to become very simple. So I can say that t is tan x and then dt is going to be sec square x dx. So that's going to take care of this function here or this part of the function here. So then I substitute here. So I get the integral is t to the power 4, 1 plus t square. So that's coming from here and dt is here. So now this becomes a simple polynomial. So I can simply write t4 plus t6. And then I get t5 by 5 plus t7 by 7 plus c. That's a very simple and nice integral. Now, in these cases, always remember to put back tan x into the equation here because you are expected to write the final integral in terms of the value of x, which was there in the first place. Whatever substitution we are using here, like t equal to tan x, that is an intermediate variable. So we should not express things in terms of the intermediate variable. When we write the final solution, we should go back to the starting variable x, which was used. So finally, let's turn to question number 10, which was you are asked to calculate a, a, t, where a, t is given by this value. Now, if a transpose is given by this value, a is going to be 1, 0, 2 here. Now, here we can calculate a into a, t by this expression. Now, here always remember that when we are multiplying two matrices, we can always think of vectors as matrices. This one corresponds to 1 into 3, that is one row into three column. And this is a 3 into 1, that is three row into one column matrix. So you can multiply them because these two threes are equal and the final output is going to have the size one by one. So that's the output here. So if I do this multiplication, I get one into one plus zero into zero plus two into two. So one plus zero plus four, that is five. So A, A, T is equal to five. So it's going to be a scalar. Now let's calculate A, T into A. So we have to find this particular expression. So now if you look at it, we see that 102 written like this is a three row into one column. 102 written like this is a one row into three column. So we can multiply it because these two ones are equal, but the output is going to be a three by three matrix out here. So let's do that. So we get one into one is one, one into zero is zero, one into two is two. Then we get the second one in terms of by multiplying by the zeros out there. So zero into one, zero into zero, zero into two. And then I get here two into one, two into zero and two into two. So that's the two zero four here. So in this case, what happens that so I'm multiplying these two vectors, I end up with a three by three matrix. So in matrix multiplication, you always need to be very careful of what are the row and column dimensions of the matrices concerned. So that's something which is very important to know. So this was a set of 10 questions to get you warmed up about the possible interview questions you can face. And also, if you are somebody who is preparing for any exam, maybe at the high school level, maybe even at college levels, this level of mathematics is something which is expected of anybody who is trying to get involved in a STEM discipline, that is science, technology, engineering, and math. But also, it is frequently required even in disciplines such as finance, business, and social sciences, because like I've mentioned before, mathematics tends to penetrate all disciplines. It's, it's even getting into biology, for example, in the field of mathematical biology. So I'll stop this video now. Do see some of the videos on the end screen for more deep dive into some of the aspects about optimization and so on. And I'll see you in my, my video sometime soon. See you then.